Welcome to Sword of the Spirit, written and presented by Colin Dye, Senior Minister of Kensington Temple and leader of London City Church. Sword of the Spirit is a dynamic teaching series equipping the believers of today to build the disciples of tomorrow. We pray that you find these programs inspiring and a catalyst in deepening your knowledge of God, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. We're talking about God the Father, knowing the Father. That's our theme for this current series. And we've been looking at the attributes of God the Father as revealed in the New Testament. I've stressed that God is the eternal God and Father of the eternal Son, Jesus Christ. And we only know this by the Holy Spirit. The Christian doctrine of the Trinity is vitally important, even though it's difficult to understand. But if we could understand it, if we could reason it with our minds, then God would not be God. He transcends our understanding. But thankfully, this is not just a question of philosophy. It is our personal and practical experience. That's why in the series, I'm encouraging you to get to know God the Father through Jesus Christ, His Son. We've been seeing how God the Father shows Himself in all His power and His glory. He is the great, glorious God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We've seen also that He is the God of infinite wisdom and His will is perfect in everything. We've seen also that He is the Holy One. Jesus calls Him the Holy Father. God the Father is a holy God. And that's wonderful because we can be reconciled to Him through faith in Jesus Christ. We also see that He is the God of righteousness and of wrath. It's not as if God is this gentle being, this kind of benevolent father with a long beard somewhere up in the sky, a kind of Santa Claus of the Christian faith. Not at all. He is righteous and he exercises his righteous reaction against sin, which is his wrath. That's why we need to come to know Christ as the Savior who turns away the wrath of the Father for us so that we can also call our God Father. We also see that this is as a result of His faithfulness and His mercy and His grace at work in our lives. And so as we look at these wonderful attributes of God the Father, we get to know Him, not just that we can list His characteristics, but it's also that we can know these things for ourselves. And as you watch today's program, I pray that God will draw you closer and closer into His faithfulness and into His love so that you can know personally and intimately God as your Heavenly Father. This is the most wonderful privilege and it's yours through Jesus Christ. Last session we ended rather abruptly in looking at some of the attributes of the Father. And uh, I want to make sure that you go over the, that section again and again in your manuals. I'm going to cover the headings again with you now so that you will know that this is something to be emphasized. It's the heart of the revelation of God, God as Father. And the New Testament shows us that He is the God of glory and power. That's what it means in the New Testament. Secondly, that He's, He is the God of wisdom and His will operates in a fatherly way. Number three, we see him as father in his absolute holiness. He is the holy father. We also see him in his righteousness and wrath, number four. And that is a very significant aspect. We cannot think that wrath belongs to the God of the Old Testament and it's nothing to do with the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus understands the Father's wrath because he drank that cup of wrath to the last bitter drop that you and I could have a life free from the wrath of God. Number five, we speak about the Father's love and his grace. So many scriptures that show us the loving, gracious nature of God our Father. And number six, we saw his 
faithfulness and his peace. We've seen the faith of God as we look together in living faith. That means that God is faithful. He will keep his word. He'll never break his word. He is faithful in calling people into fellowship with his son. He is faithful in guarding his children against excessive testing of their faith. A marvelous promise. And let me just go through this. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. This verses like this, and it's a shame to be skipping over them, quite frankly, but verses like these verses here show us exactly what the Father is like and the practical nature of this teaching on the fatherhood of God. It's not just filling our heads full of texts, but showing that we can trust God who is faithful. It says, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13, no temptation has overtaken you except that which is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but will, with the temptation, also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. God's faithfulness is on the line. He says here, I am your father, and I'm going to be faithful to you. I'm not going to allow anything to come into your life that you're not going to be able to stand. That's wonderful. And if he calls you to a trial, he'll give you grace to bear it and to to bear up under it. God is faithful. Remember that. Remember that. And so we have other verses here. He is faithful in keeping his word, faithful in protecting us from the evil one, faithful to inspire and to strengthen us as suffering believers, faithful to forgive sins. Now that's an amazing verse. 1 John 1 verse 9. God's faithfulness and justice mean he must forgive sins. He must. We're so used to being told God is just and must punish sin, but he has. He has justly punished sin in the person of Christ. What the law could not do and that it was weakened through sinful flesh, Christ has done, God has done in condemning sin in the the weakness of flesh. God condemned sin in the person of Christ. And because he condemned sin, he is now faithful and just and will forgive us, must forgive us for Jesus' sake. He cannot say no to the Son. 1 John 1 verse 9, let's read it again. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God is faithful even when we are faithless. Now, that's a mind-boggling concept. God's faithfulness is not dependent upon anything else. God's faithfulness is not dependent on something outside of himself. He doesn't cease to be faithful just because other people let him down. He doesn't treat us the way we treat him. Not at all. 2 Timothy 2, verse 13. Paul is calling us to faithfulness, but he says... If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Because God's faithfulness is part of his character, he cannot cease to be faithful. For him to cease to be faithful would be to deny himself. I'm so glad that that God is my God and my Father because it means that even when I fail, He doesn't fail. When I fall, He doesn't fall. When I am weak, He is not weak. And when I am faithless, He remains faithful. So throughout the, Old, the New Testament, we are constantly brought to the unceasing and unchanging nature of God And the significance of that for us as believers is that the Father can be trusted to fulfill every promise he's ever made. Now, everything that God gives to us as his children comes from himself in his nature. He doesn't give away anything that's not part of himself. And it requires a deep grasp of this truth for us to see what's a a firm foundation God has given us. And it's one of the most important applications that I consider throughout this whole series of the Sword of the Spirit teachings and whatever topic we're on. God is faithful and he will never let us down. So all Paul's epistles begin with this blessing which includes the peace of God. 
So he is the God of faithfulness and the God of peace. And if this peace is a quality which God imparts, it must also be a quality that God possesses. He has it and he gives it away. Romans 15, 33, Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. He said it all when he said that. The God of peace be with you. He is the God of peace, not only because he gives peace, but because he is peace. So that tells us something. In these troubled times, in these turbulent days, that there is at the center of the universe a God who holds all things together in the palm of his hand, a God who is at perfect peace. He's not troubled or disturbed by the situations or circumstances of man or of history. He's not thrown by this as if to call a quick emergency summit meeting in heaven with Gabriel and the rest of the angels and saying, oh my, 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 what are we going to do now? Look what they're doing down there. No, here's a God who always maintains a perfect equilibrium and a God who promises that that same equilibrium, which the Bible calls the shalom of God, will permeate and be practically manifested throughout the whole universe because when our Savior, who is the Prince of Peace, returns, he will establish out of chaos the peace, which is God himself. And so, here we have the description of God our Father. And uh, uh, what a, an amazing revelation it is. It suggests that everything we know about God is predicated upon this wonderful assumption and revelation that God is Father. The Yahweh Elohim of the Old Testament, the creator of, the, of heaven and earth, is both fatherly and sovereign. He is the king of the universe, but he never acts tyrannically because he is the father. And by that, he is not the dictator. He is not the tyrannical dictator, although he is sovereign. Neither is he the arch manipulator. He neither dictates nor manipulates. He is God. He is the righteous judge, but he always acts mercifully, mercifully because his justice is shaped by his fatherhood. And so we've seen in these that there are paradoxical attributes, attributes which seem to be opposites, but which in reality are perfectly balanced. His love and his wrath, his goodness and his righteousness, his mercy and his judgment his transcendence and his imminence. And so we can go on and on and on. All of these qualities of God are perfectly balanced in him. And it's also true to say that therefore we should hold our understanding of God in these respects in perfect balance as well. Otherwise we get very unbalanced and whole theologies can go astray and can go awry, can get bent out of shape and it seems you have Calvinism and Arminianism and both say something about God, but both also deny something special about him. We need to look at every system of theology in this light to make sure that the system balances everything the Bible says about God in perfect tension or in perfect wholeness. For the whole of our Christian faith hangs on our knowledge of God. The whole purpose of our faith is that we might know God accurately, intimately and personally. It's, for example, impossible for us to understand the incarnation, which brings us to the very person of Christ, if we have a wrong idea about God. People who think that God is this angry, remote, dictator-type being who needs to be placated, they're bound to misunderstand Jesus' mission and ministry. It is only a father who loves his children that sends Jesus to redeem them. Now, let me say this. This is why, in the way that the series is coming out, I'm covering first knowing the father before we go to salvation by grace. Because although knowing the father, I, I would suggest to you, is one of the most technical of all of these manuals that I've produced, and the teaching is perhaps the hardest to follow, nevertheless... 
It's the most fundamental of, the whole, of all of them, the most foundational of all. If we do not know the Father, the Son has died in vain. Okay, I want you now to go on to the, the next uh, section because we're going to now begin to look at the Father and the Son. And here is when we begin to explore in more depth the relationships within the Godhead. And from this moment onwards, we'll be looking not so much at the fatherhood which belongs to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, but we'll be beginning to focus on the first person of the Godhead, God the Father. And so this course, Knowing the Father, deals with both aspects. The fatherhood of God in general, as God Father and Son, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, and the first person of the Godhead, the first person of the Trinity, God the Father. And so we know about Him, and we know Him through the Son. So we begin by looking at the relationship between the Father and the Son. And a man who is a, a postgraduate doctorate, a man who has a doctorate from, uh, Cambridge, from Oxford University, excuse me for mixing those two universities up, uh, who was talking to me on this subject said, Colin, you are dealing with, the, with doctrine as deep as it ever gets. So are you ready to take the plunge? Have you got your life jackets? All right, are your feet touching the bottom? No. Are you out of your depth? Yes. Don't worry, my feet aren't touching the bottom either. We're going to look at this, and in doing this, and in the next uh, topic, which goes on to talk about the relationship between the Father and the Spirit, we are building up a New Testament understanding of God as Trinity. So I'm actually setting my sight on several different goals here, and we're going to hit them all one by one. Now, at the very beginning of our teaching on knowing the Father, we saw that the supreme nature of God means that there can be only one God. If He is infinite, He both fills everything and is beyond everything. And so these terms, which are by now familiar to you, His omnipotence, His all-powerfulness, His transcendence, that is his nature that exists beyond everything that is seen or heard or touched or felt or even or created. God's transcendence and his imminence, that is his presence that completely fills the universe. These aspects of God and our understanding of him in these, in these respects shows that there can be no possibility of there ever being another God. There is only one God, the supreme God, who is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we begin to see, even in Old Testament teaching, that this one God carries some form of plurality in his nature, in his being, not one God that shows himself in different ways as Father, Son, and Spirit, but one God who exists in his being and nature in three distinctions. And even in the Old Testament, there's this hint that God is one, his nature is one and a unity, but he is also more than one. There is a hint We've seen it in the earlier sessions that Elohim is a plural noun which takes a singular verb. Genesis 1, 26, 27. Then God said, let us, Elohim, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And so throughout those verses, we have the I and the we, the he and the they, we pass between the one and the other. So this one God, Elohim, is we. Now, some scholars insist that Elohim is just a common noun. It's not really a special noun. It's just a common noun. 
and uh, its plural form can be explained by the Hebrew tendency to speak of things in the plural when they are seeking to intensify an idea. For example, the Hebrew word blood is never found in the singular. It's always plural, bloods, showing something of intense significance about blood. It's revealing something about Hebrew thinking. And so they say the word Elohim is just a common noun. It's a plural of majesty to try. It's like the royal we, you know. The Queen of England says, we are very pleased to be here. And you say, well, where are the others if you're here? <laughs> it's the plural of majesty, the kind of royal we. So that's a, a, a trace of this kind of use in English. Well, they suggest that this is what it means. Elohim is a kind of majestic statement, and the, and the plural there is to, is to point towards some kind of majesty that exists within God. And yet, when we study this carefully, we find that Elohim is not just a common noun. It is a proper noun. In other words, it is a name, and it suggests that there is something corporate about God. And don't forget also, as I taught you in the earlier session when we were looking at the name Elohim, that the other Semitic languages have this word, but it's never in the plural. But when the Hebrews get a hold of it, they, they put it into the plural, which means that they're trying to say something special about their God that, not, that cannot be said about the other God or the other gods of the nations. And uh, we've also seen, too, and here is a, a kind of, it's a, just a, a little thought. It's, I wouldn't want you to put too much weight on it, but for interest's sake, I included it in the manual. Yahweh Sabaoth, usually translated the Lord of hosts, meaning the Lord who possesses armies or hosts, can also be translated as the Lord who is hosts. And this, if that were the case, this would suggest that the name Yahweh Sabaoth implies that God is not simply this cold arithmetic oneness, this indivisible oneness, that there is a plurality about him. There are some, some distinctions within the one God. Now, there are several Old Testament references which uh, begin to build on this understanding. For example, those class of scriptures that speak of the angel of the Lord, who sometimes appears in human form. Now, there's this enigmatic being that, that somehow appears, and when you first read about him in the text, uh, is described as the angel of the Lord, and, uh, and you just think, well, this is just some angel, and then the people start talking as if they've met with God. And you say, well, who was this fellow? Now, remember, the word angel simply means messenger. So it doesn't mean to say this is an angelic being, a created being. And when we examine this, it begins to point to the direction that we're talking about a pre-incarnate appearance of the second person of the Trinity of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. For example, Genesis 31 and verse 11, then the angel of God spoke to me in a dream, saying, Jacob, and I said, here I am. And he said, lift up your eyes now and see. All the rams which leap on the flocks are streaked, speckled, and gray spotted. For I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed the pillar and where you made a, a vow to me. Now arise, get out of this land, return to the land of your family. The angel of God appears and says, I am the God of Bethel. I am the God who appeared to you. And how did he appear to, to Jacob in that dream at Bethel? He appeared as the God of your father Abraham, the God of Isaac. This is God himself appearing in a dream as the angel of God. Exodus 3, verses 1 to 6. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. 
And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush. But I thought it was the angel of the Lord. Well, it is the angel of the Lord. Does that mean to say the angel of the Lord is God? Yes, that's right. But is the angel of the Lord all there is to God? No. What we're seeing, even in Old Testament times, is that there is a second alongside God. And remember that all this is in the context of a very strong monotheistic faith. The strongest monotheistic faith that has ever been seen. Judaism. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord, one God. And so we see in this very strict understanding that God is one, there is a second alongside God, the angel of the Lord speaking to Moses out of the bush, and it is God speaking, and God called him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Then he said, do not draw near this place, take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Oh, this angel of the Lord is no, he's no, he's no angel in the category of Michael and Gabriel or, or any of the other created beings. This angel of the Lord is God himself. And here we have an appearance of God, which we call in these pre-incarnate times a theophany, which means appearance of God, or Christophany, an appearance of Christ. And there are many, many other examples of this as we see them. And I've listed some for you in the Old Testament. And that brings today's teaching on knowing the Father to an end. I pray that as you've been watching today and throughout all these programs, God will be drawing you closer and closer to his love, that you will really get to know the Father. We'll be back next time with more in the Sword of the Spirit series on knowing the Father. God bless you. <music>